Okay, I'm back. I'm ready to do daily bread now. I'm just had to. I just need to talk about it. Anyway, okay, so this is. Oh, I put February 9th. It's supposed to be February 19th, but we meant what I knew, right? Alright, so this is today's daily. Well, heck. It's, well, okay, it was yesterday's. When I started this, it was yesterday. So this is February 19th, daily bread. Um, you can pass this as a left I have a typo there. It's not really that big deal, really. We know what we know what I meant. Uh, the insight scripture is going to be First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18, and we're going to be reading uh, Leviticus 25 and Mark 1, verses 23 through 45. Um, I put an extra scripture in here, a scripture, an extra link. Um, which you'll see what it's about. Oh my gosh, that's a really long link to, ah, well, when we get to the, the story, it'll, you'll see what it's about. It's about prayer basics or something like that. We'll see. Father, as we get into your word, I just ask that you bless the reader and the hearer, the reading and the hearing, and all of the good things, uh, all of the above on your word, Father. I just I, I ask, Father, that you help us and encourage us to stay in your word and to seek a relationship with you and, and, and desire to walk with you and to study your word and to learn. Father, I ask, hey, it's 1212, Father, I see you, I hear you, I see you. I ask, Father, that you increase our knowledge and our wisdom, our discernment and our understanding. Father, give us the desire to seek your face and to stay in your word and to study your word and to know the signs of the times and to be close to you because I know you desire to be close to us you came to earth and became a man and died in our place so you could have this relationship with us father help us to remember that our life is not our own but it was bought at a very precious price help us to honor that father and to to be obedient to your word in serving you and praising you and glorifying your holy name. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I have to try to remember. I bought a ticket to go see. Uh, I didn't get to see the first three ver uh, episodes, but I'm going to go see four through seven of The Chosen tomorrow just so I can escape this house for a while. It's like three hours to see those episodes, but that's okay. I don't even care that I didn't get to see the first three. I just want to go and see them, see see it, just to get out of the house. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18. Believers in Jesus can learn from Paul's exhortations, example, and experiences of what could be called the Pauline School of Prayer. Turn that piece off and I'll put the reviews to that. Girl, you call, honey? You should squish you. You should squish you. I see. I'm not telling you anything. Hey. Yeah, hey. I'm not going to support you. I'm not going to support you. Okay. 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 Paul, however, didn't simply encourage prayer. He himself prayed for his fellow believers in Christ. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We seek a similar pattern in Colossians, where in the context of his prayers for them, Paul spoke of giving thanks for believers in Jesus. Then, as if to encourage them to follow his pattern, he exhorted them to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas prayed in the prison at Philippi, and Paul's experience on the storm-tossed sea likely prompted prayer. And this was written by Arthur Jackson. I didn't leave the thing up so I can't like click on these, but it's okay. It's late. We're just going to get this done and go. So the scripture reads for Festival. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18, various exhortations. 
And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And the, t the story is called Prompted to Pray. A co-worker once told me that her prayer life had improved because of our manager. I was impressed, thinking that our difficult leader had shared some spiritual nuggets with her and influenced how she prays. I was wrong, sort of. My co-worker and friend went on to explain, Every time I see him coming, I start praying. Her time of prayer had improved because she prayed more before each conversation with him. She knew she needed God's help in her challenging work relationship with her manager, and she called out to him more because of it. I know that feeling. I've had a manager like that. My co-worker's practice of praying during tough times and interactions is something I've adopted. It's also a biblical practice found in 1 Thessalonians when Paul reminds the believers in Jesus to pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. No matter what we face, prayer is always the best practice. It keeps us connected with God and invites the Spirit to direct us. Galatians 5.16 Rather than having us rely on our human inclinations, this helps us live in peace with each other, 1 Thessalonians 5.13, even when we face conflicts. As God helps us, we can rejoice in Him, pray about everything, and give thanks often. And those things will help us live in even greater harmony with our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Amen. And this was written by Katera Patton. Let's see. Make sure you're hearing me. Oh, yeah. Okay. Try not to talk too loud. Try not to talk too loud. Can you even hear me now? Okay, yeah. What relation yeah, what relationships do you need to pray about more frequently? <laughs> we already know this. How can prayer help you follow God's leading versus your human tendencies? If any of y'all heard what I have recorded a little bit ago, a live stream, you would see the irony <laughs> in these very words right here. God is so good all the time. Heavenly Father, please help us to remember to pray continually as we seek to live in harmony with others. I try. I really do. And here's where it says, learn how to deepen your prayer life. And, and that really long link uh, in the description, this like a, I even went to that page to try to see if there was a shorter one. But that's part of the... Uh, the stud, the university, uh, you know, the our daily bread org, you know, like learning university where they have free learning. So it's a really long URL address. Lot of good stuff on that page though, that website. Okay, Leviticus twenty five. Put my chips down. <laughs> Okay, the Sabbath of the seventh year. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field. Now, I took the kittens out yesterday. Now, today, she's sneezing. 
and sneezing and sneezing. She's allergic to something. Tell me. Bite my throat. Weirdo. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your unintended vine. For it is a year of rest for the land, and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired men, and the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock and the beasts that are in your land. All its produce shall be for food. The year of Jubilee. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. On the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate. I'm sorry, I'm looking, oh, I washed some towels and I haven't put them up. And I'm sitting here trying to read this and I'm not trying to peek over the towels instead of just moving them. I'm such a dork. Jeez, the towels up. <laughs> you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppose one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor, and according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price, and according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price, for he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. And someone has the air conditioner on. Excuse me. Thank you. These people are insane. Anyway. Uh, don't even know. I'm just going to say redemption of property. I'm just going to say we're done with this page. I'm going to go to the next one. Because I have no idea where I was. The land should not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale, and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. But if he is not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his possession. If a man sells a house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it throughout his generations. It shall not be released in the Jubilee. However, the houses of villages which have no wall around them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they may and they shall be released in the Jubilee. Nevertheless, the cities of the Levites and the houses and the cities of their possession, the Levites may redeem it, may redeem it any time. And if a man purchases a house from the Levites, 
then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the Jubilee. For the houses and the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the fields of the common land of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession, lending to the poor. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him, like a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God, that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. The Law Concerning Slavery And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you. Sorry, I just remember I didn't take my blood pressure pill tonight. That might explain why it's a little high. 160 over 96. I knew I should have grabbed the water and talked about it. Oh, isn't that special? Let's just do this. Um, and then he shall depart from you, he and his children with them, and he shall and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And as for your male and female slaves whom you may have from the nations that are around you, from them you may be buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you, and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Now if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family. After he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who is near kin to him in his family may redeem him, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his jubilee shall be according to the number of years, from the year that he was he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. It shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him. If there are still many years remaining, according to them he shall repay the price of his redemption for the money with which he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and account according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so that is that. Go ahead and close that. And then Mark, we're picking up on verse 23 to 45. Okay. I have to grab water here. Okay.
sorry about that. I just went ahead and grabbed another tea because my case of water is like, oh, gosh, it's all, it's right by his uh, fan. Gosh. And I don't want to crinkle that plastic. Oh, God forbid, knock his fan over. <laughs> He's snoring so. It hurts my hand so bad. Jesus. Okay, we're making good time, so I'm not going to mess this up. Alright, let's do this. Alright, so picking up on verse 23. <laughs> and immediately there was in their synagogue a man. Alright, give me just a second. Catch my breath. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chew my... Uh, no, it's only anyway because it's 1230 and I'm taking any of my night pills and I'm like wide awake. I catch my breath anyway. Run up those stairs. Mm. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Why have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. You will see Capernaum on the map above on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum was the home of these first four apostles and would be Jesus' home base. Okay, we, I read this part, remember? I read this because we had stopped, you know, read these two. So I read this study part. And I'd left off here where it says, Following the reading and teaching of the law, it appears the people were given an opportunity to speak. See Acts 13, 15. So let me... Oh, actually, you know what? I have my Chuck Smith Bible right here. I need to get this disc to the pastor Glenda. I know she'll want it. It'll probably make her cry because, you know, she'll hear Ron in there, but... At the same time, it will make her happy, too, you know, because it will bring up good memories for her. I can't even imagine being married to your best friend for 40 years, 40 years. Oh, I don't even know how she does it. It's like he passed away in March of 2020, right? And we had one service in church and then we got quarantined you know we got everyone got locked down so she couldn't even be with anyone she had to mourn by herself jeez okay so oh 13 15 oh yeah that's what i'm looking at that's 13 15. um and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying men and brethren if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And what it says in the side here for verse 15, it refers to Luke 4, 16, Hebrews 13, 22. Uh, and so it's referring to exhortation or encouragement. So exhortation, I guess, means encouragement. I guess that's what it's talking about. I have yet to kind of figure out the study part of this, this Bible. Uh, Let's see where it goes, 1315. Oh, it doesn't even talk about 1315 for us, and that's special. Alrighty then. What is this? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The exhortation is encouragement. Okay. Now I understand what those are things. Are. The little letters. Okay. Anyway, Jesus took the opportunity to, to preach to his fellow Jews. Jesus' teaching was different from that of the scribes. Still, yeah. 
The scribes could only interpret the law as given by God. They probably used the writing in the Talmud, the oral interpretations of rabbis, to teach the people. These traditions were uninspired and often misguided, as Matthew's Gospel showed us. But Jesus taught with authority. Jesus, as God, could speak about the law as the lawgiver because he wrote the law, right? That was God in the flesh. So, of course, he taught with authority. He's the one that wrote it. It was God. Come on. Oh, man, what I would have given to have been alive and lived there in the day when God was walking the earth as man. Oh, you know? Jeez. I would have loved that, except I wouldn't have probably got to see him. Because, well, I don't know, though. See, that's the thing. I have distant relatives that were born in Israel. They were from Israel, so more than likely I have Jewish blood. It's a very, very, very good chance, especially since 51%, over 51% of my DNA comes from Northwestern, I think it's Northwestern Europe, wherever the Ashkenazi Jews are from. That's where over 51% of my DNA comes from. I one of these days I want to get tested for Jewish DNA. Anyway, anyway, so I might have seen him. I might have. He articulated it to the people as its author, because he was. Many of the Jews may have questioned Jesus' authority to speak with such boldness about the law. He was not a trained scribe or rabbi. What made him think he had insights into the law, their respective scholarly leaders didn't. Their respective scholarly leaders didn't. Bless God, as Bishop Ron used to say, bless God. Proof was about to be provided. Well, well. A man with an unclean spirit was in the synagogue. The spirit cried out, announcing Jesus' identity to the attendants. This is twice that Jesus' identity was called out by not him, right? But showing who he is. God called from the heavens. This is my son, whom I am well pleased. After the Holy Spirit came down as a, go as a dove, right? There's your trinity there, right? And here an unclean spirit says, What if you do have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? We know you who you are, the Holy One of God. Right? And he has to tell him. Now what, Toby? He is so silly. He jumps on her back, he gets in place, and then he washes the back of her neck, and he thinks that's what he has to do. <laughs> silly, silly boy. As long as that's all he does, we won't have any extra kitties. Um, anyway, I have to watch it close, though. The spirit cried out, announcing his identity to the attendants. Christ told him to be silent. Jesus' evidence of authority was to be made known through power, not the word of a demon. Right? Jesus then commanded the spirit to come out of the man, which it obediently did. Well, of course it did. <laughs> Shoot ya. God, ya. Jesus' words had authority in the spiritual world. The Jews had exorcists, but none had the power to command demons with the word. This was evidently clear to the Jews. Now see, one thing, like in The Chosen, when Nicodemus went to try to cast the, the demons or whatever out of that woman in the red quarter, he was like bringing hyssop and wormwood and all these spices, and he had the little string of bells, whatever those things are called, and, and he was burning incense and all these things that these exorcists would use. Like even modern day, you know, Catholic priests that do exorcisms, they have like the holy water and they have this and they have that to do the exorcism. Jesus, he didn't have to have any of that. He's telling them, out. He's the word, he just tell them, uh, bye, you know. Done. Get out. You're, you have no authority there. Get out. out. Bye bye. Saw you later. Yeah, I like that. 
So the Jews who questioned Jesus' authority to speak with boldness about the law just had a reason to sit down and pay attention. They just had a reason to sit down and pay attention. And they were going to learn today, right? It should have been a lesson to the scribes that it was their turn to be students instead of teachers. The rest of the Gospels reveal they failed to learn that lesson. Their pride wouldn't let them relinquish the teaching position. The application, pride is a dangerous opponent to learning new things. Learning requires humbling yourself below a teacher. There will be many people, even many Christian people, who will endanger their souls because they won't relinquish the seat of the scribes to be taught by Jesus. Why are there massively different beliefs within the Christian tradition? Oh, that there, like the possessive? That's supposed to be there, like over there, over there. Why are there massively different beliefs within the Christian? Sorry, I had to fix that. I couldn't. I could. I couldn't leave that. Okay. Now where was I? Why are there massively different beliefs within the Christian tradition? A lot of times it is because people think that they know God and aren't willing to be taught by God. Through the life of Christ and the instruction of the Spirit through the Word, who God actually is and wants them to be. The scribes thought they knew God. They didn't know God. Jesus tried to show them and they wrote him off. Verses 29 through 34. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Toby, Toby, no, she was drinking first. Quit being a boy. Come here. Come sit here. Come sit here. Come sit in my lap. Let me let you. Let me pet you. Let me pet you. Let me pet you. Jesus said, oh, you farted. Go. You can go on then. Ew. I think cat farts are way worse than dog farts ever thought of being. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's what I get, huh? <laughs> oh, gross. I hope that's all like that was. I hope you can just leave a little pan of <laughs> That's disgusting. That's disgusting. Jesus then departs the synagogue and goes to Simon and Andrew's house. Simon's mother in law there was there, sick, and Jesus heals her. At sundown, the people of the city found Jesus and started bringing their sick out to him to be healed. Why did they wait until sundown? Good question. Probably because the Sabbath day ended at sundown. Oh, I didn't know it was the Sabbath. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's why. Yeah, because you weren't supposed to. You weren't supposed to get healed of your sickness on the Sabbath. You had to wait until the first day of the week. So, yeah. Mm. The Jews' days ran from sun. They still do, from sundown to sundown. Uh, they were restricted from walking more than a short distance or carrying burdens on the Sabbath day. When the sun went down, those restrictions were lifted, and they all came out to find Jesus. The Bible says the whole city was at the door. Jesus was running a world-changing operation out of a fisherman's house, probably the most normal, unremarkable house ever. That's weird. Who on earth would have expected it to be this way? Imagine if someone came up to you and said, the Messiah is staying two blocks down from your house in your neighborhood. Now, he's saying, I want you to think about just how ridiculous that would be to hear. Divine truth was to be found in a normal home accessible to everyone, not an exclusive palace sealed off to all but a few. I think that is one of the most beautiful things about God's plan. God's truth can be found in the most ordinary places and it is sometimes encountered unintentionally, in a place one would never expect by those who are seeking truth. On the most ordinary day, a person with open ears 
can encounter life-changing truth. God's good news moves through the ordinary in an extraordinary way. This ought to be a lesson to us, not to discard truth because we deem its origin too ordinary. This person doesn't have anything to teach me. This person isn't as educated as me. They have nothing to tell me. Either of these attitudes would have pushed Christ aside as too common. How many people do you think thought the most important news in the history of the world affecting the souls of all men, past, present, and future, would show up first in a fisherman's house in average old Capernaum? The delivery of the gospel has to be one of its most shocking attributes. Jesus again forbids the demons from revealing his identity. Verses 35-39 And rising very, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here we find Jesus, after a long night of helping needy people, rising early in the morning to be with his Father. There are times when we need to sacrifice physically to make sure our souls are healthy. I don't think that is a very widely practiced spiritual discipline. No. What does this president do to our excuses for not praying, studying, attending worship, or being present to help our brothers and sisters? I was too tired. I was too busy. I did a lot of good work already today. This one gets me. Uh, no. Jesus didn't neglect his time with God or his time helping those who needed him. Thank you for sneezing on my foot, Bella. Obviously, this can be taken to extremes, but I think Jesus' example here is something we could all do a little bit better at. When Jesus' disciples finally find them, they say, Everyone is looking for you. They were probably thinking, What are you doing? You've got a whole crowd of people down there waiting for you at the door. So why do so many well-known preachers fall into sin? Because they spend too much time with the crowds of people wanting to see them and too little time alone with God. Same is true for any Christian. We can get so busy, even busy with good works, that we unknowingly drift away from God because we aren't being intentional about drawing near to Him. Amen. This is true. Jesus' response is curious and worth considering. When His apostles tell Him the crowds are waiting for Him, He tells them they aren't going back down to the adoring crowds. Why? Because the Gospel needed preaching in other places. Weren't there more sick people that needed healed down in Capernaum? Yes, it wasn't that good work. Yes, but Jesus had priorities. Healing sick people was a good thing, but preaching was a better thing. I think this is an important lesson for the modern church and modern Christians to learn. There's a difference between good and better. It's a good thing to go to the lake with your family and appreciate the creation of God. It's a good thing to devote time to learning to play an instrument. It's a good thing to go to the gym and lift weights to be healthy. It's a good thing to put your kids in sports and help them develop as a player. It's a good thing to have a hobby. All of those things are good and there's nothing inherently sinful about any of those things. But maybe the church is struggling and isn't growing like it should because Christians are spending a lot of time doing those good things and not pursuing the better things. Mary knew the better things when she was sitting at the feet of Christ and listening to his teachings. Amen. Here we see Jesus turning down a good thing to accomplish his better and ultimate purpose. As followers of Christ, we have been given a similar, better, and ultimate purpose. Many of the decisions we face are between good and better. How often do you choose the good option over the better option? Just because we aren't choosing to sin doesn't mean we are being everything God has called us to be. Um, we can't choose to not sin. We're going to sin whether we want to or not. <laughs> we can't help ourselves. We have the sinful nature. We were born with it. Until we get our glorified bodies, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? Even Paul said, That which I know that I ought not to do, I do, and that which I know that I should, I don't. 
O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin. Amen? So, don't say just because we aren't choosing to sin. Oh, no, no. You know, I know of another pastor or evangelist on TV or whatever that was like, Oh, once I realized I was saved, I quit sinning. No, you didn't. You just sinned just then because you're lying. We were born sinners. And our flesh is going to die. I said, but we're going to be redeemed through the blood of Jesus. The flesh has a sinful nature. But our souls are redeemed through the blood of Christ. Amen. I didn't tell you to go that way. Go that way. The Christian life is not always a choice between black and white, good and bad, right and wrong. It's often a choice between good and better. Just take his disciples and begin a short preaching tour in the city and synagogues of Galilee. Oh, Jesus takes his disciples and begins a short preaching tour in the cities and synagogues of Galilee. Okay, and then the last five verses. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling to him. And kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for yourself. Offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. We just got through reading in Leviticus what all had to be done for the cleansing of a leper. Now, go shave your head. Right? You're going to have to live outside of his tent for seven days after, he's, he's, after the priest says he's clean. Then he's going to have to shave his body. And then on the eighth day he can live inside his tent. Hang on, taking the paint outside. Okay, verse 45. But he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. During his journey through Galilee, a leper approached Jesus. If you would like some more details on leprosy, check out the notes on Matthew chapter 8. The other, the, the video I did earlier, I put the link to, uh, that should take you straight to, to be like Christ, the, the whole Bible study, like what I use here, this, and it'll take you to Matthew, and then you just go to whatever ch chapter you want. Like for that one, it was... Because you could, so you could get to, uh, chapter 3 here, go to chapter 8, whatever. Anyways, um, the leper's request or statement was marked by two proper attitudes. If you will, a submission to the will and wisdom of God, you can make me clean, a confidence in the power of God. Again, his faith is what healed him. We should be approaching God with the same attitudes. The text says Jesus was moved with pity. Jesus, who has never sinned, has pity on those who have to live in a world full of sin's consequences. He could have easily said to the man, Well, you've been a sinner too, so this is what you get. I used to lack pity for people caught up in sin. This is Luke Taylor talking, not Debbie. I used to look at people and think, How could you be that dumb? How could you be that in love with a sinful life? That is what you get for living that way. I have thought that about certain things, about certain, you know, about some people. And, you know, I have had some similar thoughts about things. And some of this, as you say, that's what you get for living that way. It wasn't until I was caught up in sin that my compassion started increasing. I'm glad Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't like me. Now, one of the, another thing you have to keep in mind is we are the redeemed of Christ, right? We are a new creature in Christ. Now, we look at someone that's still in the world, that's still in, the, in sin, and still living, like someone that's going to hell if they don't change their ways, basically. And, you know, we need to remember we used to be that person. Instead, and, you know, we need to not look down our nose at them, you know, because they're over there talking and cussing like a sailor, 
I used to cuss as bad as the guys when I was in the army. And I was in a pool tournament at this bar there in uh, El Paso, Texas. And I mean, I had a foul mouth on me. And uh, this it was a civilian. He looked at me and he says, you are such a beautiful young lady. He said, it is such a shame that you have such a, a you know, that you talk that way. And it actually snapped me awake, you know, and, and you know, it, I was like, whoa, wow, he, you know. Well, first of all, you know, I, I thanked him for the compliment, but at the same time, he was right. I mean, I was just, oh, it was disgusted. I was disgusted with myself after that. I made sure I didn't talk like that anymore. I mean, I would still slip at the F word, of course, you know, because I was still in the world. But I mean, I, oh, my gosh, I mean, effing and an effing and mf was not usually anything i said but effing f this f that effing 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 was just like part of my vocabulary you know it was like how i described everything it was bad that was military for you though you know and not having god in your life but yeah so yeah i used to be just like them so i kind of remember you know i i uh and, and then I'm still f so far from perfect. Oh my goodness, I'm so far from perfect. I still let f bad words fly. Okay, you know, they still come out of my mouth. I try not to, but when you hear it all around you all the time, it's really hard not to. For sure. Anyway, so, you know. It's real easy to be that person. Can't, yeah, see, that's what you get for being that dumb. I can't believe you're that dumb. See, you're stupid enough to start shooting drugs. See where it got you? You're stupid enough to start whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. And this is like he was saying, you know. Uh, well, no one told you to go rob that bank, you know. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. And whatever, you know, I'm just saying. Anyway. We have to remember where we came from and where God has brought us to. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm glad Jesus is... <laughs> absolutely... He has pity on a world that turned its back on him. Psalm 103.14 reads, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Jesus stretches out his hand to touch a contagious man and takes away the effects of sin. All of Jesus' healings are, in a way, a picture of his greater work. There's only like a couple of healings that he actually touches someone. Usually, it's just your faith has healed you, right? Um... Sickness and suffering entered the world because of sin, and Jesus' healings are individual pictures of his conquest of sin's consequences. Jesus, in compliance with God's law, Leviticus 14, 2-32, which we read not too long ago, told the man to complete the prescribed visit to the priest for confirmation of his healing. How many so-called healers today encourage their patients to follow up with the doctor for confirmation? Why did Jesus tell the man not to tell anyone if he knew he was going to tell people? That's a good question, too. Why did Jesus preach to people he knew weren't going to listen to him? Why did Jesus this mentor Judas? Why did Jesus mentor Judas if he knew he would betray him? I think there's a lot of things Jesus did for our benefit and our learning, even though he already knew the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. If Jesus never humanized any of his experience for us, his interactions would probably be really confusing. Why aren't as many people interested in knowing Jesus today as they were when he was performing physical healings? Because they have to see it to believe it. Well, we don't see towns of people flooding into church buildings to learn about Jesus. Why? First, people are not as in tune, or shall I say, in sync, ha ha ha, with their spiritual needs as they are with their physical needs. 
When a person is physically sick, it's an inconvenience to their lives. We feel our physical ailments very keenly. We often don't feel our spiritual needs as needing the same immediate attention. Second, Jesus' remedy for spiritual needs requires serious commitment. I think many people in the world feel the symptoms of spiritual sickness. Their consequences bother them as a result of wickedness in their lives. They feel a void they can't seem to fill, but they often take the wrong medical advice. Many people go to the doctor seeking a remedy for an ailment when they really want, when they really want, when what they really want is a prescription for some pill that would take away their symptoms. Many doctors are more than happy to assign a prescription and shuffle patients out of their office. The problem with this type of treatment is that the pills only mask the symptoms, they don't treat the underlying problems. And then, when a doctor tells someone he won't prescribe a pill, instead he will prescribe a lifestyle change to address the roots of the problem, people are less likely to get on board. I would love to stop taking all these medicines. If Dr. Madsen would tell me, hey, if you start doing this, you will no longer have pain and you can stop taking oxycodone. I would do it tomorrow. If you said, hey, if you start doing this, you don't have to take blood pressure medicine ever again. Hello? I should uh, treat this, the underlying cause and quit just treating the symptoms. Because that's all they've been doing lately is just treating the symptoms. Bleh. Anyone can take a pill, but a lifestyle change takes commitment. It's not uncommon for a person to request a doctor they know will give them the pills they want and not ask questions. No. The same is true for spiritual ailments. The devil passes out pills. He offers you a quick solution to your problems. He doesn't want you to get to the root of the problem because then you will realize Jesus is the only one offering what you need. Yes. Satan wants you to find a quick temporal solution that keeps you distracted from the real problem. Following Jesus' advice is a lifestyle change. Jesus asks us for significant commitment. He offers the only lasting remedy to the problem of sin and death, but we have to be serious. Too many people are flooding to Satan's drive through pharmacy to pick up a quick eye. And this is the end of this reading for yesterday. Yay, okay. Um... Uh, I don't know if you want these, but just in case you do, I'll put them in the description underneath everything else. <sighs> oh, I get sleepy. I don't know if I'm going to study tonight. I think I'm just going <coughs> to watch something stupid and go to bed. <coughs> Actually, I'm going to watch The Watchmen. There's one from two days ago and one for today, yesterday that I do want to watch. I'm going to share them on Facebook, too. Anyway, so, that's today, yesterday's reading. Sorry. Uh, so, just remember, time is short. The Bible is real, and the Bible is alive. Jesus is real, and Jesus is alive, and he's coming back very soon, people. It's time to choose today whom you're going to serve. Let the world go. Losing your salvation and losing your eternal life with God is not worth to get drunk or to get high or to have sex out of wedlock or to do any of these things that the world's trying to tell you is okay. You do what Jesus says. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The Ten Commandments, that shall have no other gods before me. I shall not take the Lord's na name in vain. Right? I don't know them in order, so don't, don't get mad at me. Do not take the Lord's name in vain, Lord God's name in vain. Uh, do not lie. I mean, do not steal. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. Right? Uh, uh, honor your mother and father. I know I just forgot. I, I, don't even, I didn't even keep track. Oh, got it. oh honor the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Uh, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. You shall have no graven images, right? These aren't ten suggestions. These are commandments. We're not under the law, no. We're under grace. But we still have to keep, we still have to obey God's commandments. We still have to 
Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Who do you think Jesus is? God. He's one of the triune. One of the three persons. One God. One God. Three people. Right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but it's one God. You're talking about Jesus, you're talking about God. You're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God. You're talking about God, you're talking about the Father, you're talking about God. So, if you love Jesus, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, six things God hates. Even seven, he hates a liar. And Satan's a liar. He's the father of lies. He tells you it's okay to have sex out of wedlock. He tells you it's okay to have same sex, same sex sexual relations. When Old Testament and New Testament both say that that is an abomination. And the reason being is because God created two genders, male and female. And he cr created them, male and female. Because he created the male, and from the male, he took the rib and made the female, so that they could create, procreate. Two males cannot make a baby. Two females cannot make a baby. They're not made that way. That's why there's only two genders, male and female. The male and female are the ones that can make. Because otherwise, why is there, why of uh, the animal kingdom, why is it only male and female? Why are there only two genders of dogs, cats, horses, rats, mice, turkeys? I'm just saying. But they're trying to say humans. There's more than two genders. No. We're part of the animal kingdom too. There's only two genders. Male and female. The marriage is for man and woman. God made it. God made it. So, I am not going to apologize if it's offensive to anyone for anything that I say that comes from the Word of God. Because I will stand with God and be judged by the world. Period. I will never stand with the world to be judged by God. I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. I do not fear man who can kill the body. I fear my Creator, God, my Father in Heaven, who can not only kill my body, but also kill my eternal soul. That's who I fear. So you have to choose, because if, you, if you've if you been reading with me, if you've been studying with me, or even on your own, or with someone else, and if you're aware of the times that we're in, it's just as in the days of Noah and just in the days of Lot. People are going, oh, psh, you've been saying that God's coming back for so long. They've been saying that for years, decades, centuries. They've been saying that forever. No, the signs are there. All of the prophecies are being fulfilled. Everything is pointing to Jesus going to come any, any time now to get his church because the, uh, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the uh, Mahdi for the, the Muslims, the new Dalai Lama, you know, the uh, what the the Jews that do not did not that rejected Jesus as their Messiah, they think that the Messiah that's coming is it's going to be our Antichrist. It's going to be the Muslims Mahdi. It's going to be the Orthodox Jews what they think is their and uh, Messiah, but it's actually the Antichrist. He's about to come on the world scene, but he cannot be revealed until the restrainer is removed. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit that resides in the believer. And I'm telling you, time is up. Time is pretty much up. So you have to decide, is it worth your soul, eternal soul, to continue to party and drink and have sex on a wedlock and just to blow off what the Bible says? Is it worth it? really is it worth it you know I mean I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and I'm not going to be all sweet faced with it it's just the bottom line choose this day whom you're going to serve because God is a righteous God 
and he will have judgment. And when Jesus comes the second time, when he comes and takes the church, it's 111, you will, if you're left behind, you will have to go through the tribulation. And if you survive, and if you do come to the knowledge and saving grace of Jesus Christ, and, and you get saved during the tribulation, you'll be what they call a tribulation saint. But it will be at a higher price than now. Right now, all you have to do is just surrender all to Jesus. All of it's His anyway. But if it's after He takes the church and the restrainers removed, and evil is let loose rampant on this earth, and mankind will see things they've never seen ever, and men will die from fear for their hearts failing them, because no telling what kind of evil is going to be released from the abyss, the bottomless pit is going to be released on this earth. And three and a half years into uh, the tribulation period, say, uh, the Antichrist is going to reveal his truth. It's going to reveal who he really is. And he's going to come against the saints and he will prevail. Two thirds of the Jews will be slaughtered. Don't think the Christians won't be in there too. Just as Jesus fed 5,000 men, not to include women and children, Antichrist is going to kill two-thirds of the Jews, not to include how many Christians. Pray that you go when Jesus comes for his church. If you make it through the tribulation period, you'll probably have to give your life physically because if you deny Christ or take the mark of the beast you're you're d damned but if you don't do either of those and you don't deny Christ or take the mark or worship the image of the beast then during the tribulation then he's going to put you to death probably by a guillotine who knows? Who knows how it'll be done, but I'm sure it won't be nice. Right now it's easy. The yoke is e easy and the, you know, Jesus makes it so easy. The beauty of simplicity right now. So don't, don't put it off. Don't let Satan lie to you and say you have plenty of time because you don't, people. You don't. All of the signs all of the prophecies are literally fulfilling right before our eyes. Psalm 83 war, which is what sets up Ezekiel 38 and 39. Israel is surrounded. Everything is in place for the Ezekiel 38, 39 war. God, I uh, may God, war. I mean, the only thing that's, that's left to happen is for someone to come in to sign a seven year peace agreement to put the end to the wars that are going on over there. Do you not see how close we are to the rapture? Is it still worth getting drunk, getting high? All of these things, it's time to give your life, that's not yours anyway, to the one who died for you. The one that truly loves you. Stop playing church.